This is our, uh, I think, sixth sermon from the book of Romans. And so if to you, you think, man, this doesn't make sense. It's just a bunch of flowery words that don't connect. Maybe you haven't listened to the other five. And you can do that by going on online and uh, watching them, all right? But right now, let's pray. So God, awake our soul. That's what we just sang. Send your spirit, Lord God, and, and crush our soul if need be. That what's hidden in our soul would flow out like a river. The life is in the blood. That's what scripture says, that Lord, you'd wake up our souls and your life would flow between us and back to the throne and we begin to live. In Jesus' name, we ask that, Lord God. Amen. Romans chapter two, verse 15, where we ended last time. They, the Gentiles, the nations, the unbelievers, show that the work of the law is written in their hearts. While their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them, on that day when according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. That immediately raises three fascinating questions. When is that day? What is the judgment of God? And how is it that Jews and Gentiles have the same judgment? Well, that day is the end of the ages. And Paul believes that he and we have already come to the end of the ages. 1 Corinthians uh, 10. These judgments, the judgments, these judgments happened to those in the past as an example, and they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. You see, that's how it is that we come to have the life of the age to come, that is eternal life. God judges us. Jesus said this, listen closely. Whoever hears my words and believes him who sent me has eternal life, life of the coming age. He does not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life, eternal life. Paul believed that he had already died. To the Galatians, he wrote this. You know this verse. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and delivered himself up for me. So, so if you ask Paul, when and, and where did you die? He might say, well, I died at the end of the ages. He might say, I died in the beginning because the end is the beginning. He might say on Good Friday on a tree in a garden just outside of Jerusalem, it's also when and where y'all died. For we have concluded this, writes Paul, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. He might say that, he might say any one of those things, but he, he would have also, I think, said this. I died, I died on, on a road from Jerusalem to Damascus when God revealed his son to me and within me. And you remember how it happened. Paul was a young man, a Pharisee of Pharisees, asked to zeal, a persecutor of the church, asked to righteousness under the law, Well, blameless. He had, in his words, advanced in Judaism beyond many his own age. He was winning the religion game. And he had advanced by ensuring that others would lose the religion game, particularly the followers of of Jesus. Paul was on his way to Damascus to persecute the followers of Jesus when Jesus appeared to him and burned the hell out of him and burned heaven into him. Or maybe heaven had always been in him. To the Galatians, he describes it as the day that God was pleased to reveal his son in him. That's the truth in him. In the last chapter, Paul wrote that we have all imprisoned the truth in the chains of our unrighteousness. And that means that the truth who manifests to Paul on the road to Damascus revealed the truth that had been placed within Paul from the very beginning. Jesus had been placed in Paul like seed buried in fertile soil, like a spirit or, or a breath imprisoned behind a curtain in an old stone temple, like the decision to love encased in a hard heart protected by hate. Jesus, the good in human flesh, the life of God, and the judgment of God had been buried in a tomb named Saul of Tarsus. But on the road to Damascus, 
Saul died. And Christ and Paul rose from the dead. And apparently that was and still is judgment day. Last time we preached that this picture must somehow portray judgment day. It's two trees in the middle of the garden that look like one. It's the cross in the garden on Mount Calvary. It's the tree of life in the eternal garden city of Jerusalem. It's the judgment seat of God between the two cherubim like those in the garden in the eternal sanctuary, the innermost steps of the temple. It's the throne of God on which stands the slaughtered lamb of God. It's the judgment of God upon all the judgments of humanity. It's an old painting by some Italian artist Michael always remembers his name, I forget it, but I think the artist, he just saw what I believe the Bible clearly portrays, that God's judgment does not change. But we change. In fact, that's God's judgment, (laughs) to change us into his own image. The picture illustrates two passions, right? We talked about this, two desires, two judgments. Our judgment to take the good and God's judgment to give the good. Our judgment to take the life, and God's judgment to give the life. Our judgment to hold the ball, and God's judgment to pass the ball. The judgment of God's hard to understand until you remember that God is our Father, and God's a good Father, and all good fathers share a common judgment. The judgment is fun. Damn it, kids, I paid a fortune for this vacation, and we're gonna have fun. It's a wonderful judgment to issue, but it's an incredibly challenging judgment to enforce. You know that if you're dad. It's hard to enforce because fun is a judgment that must rise from the depths of everyone's soul in freedom. Just one kid that refuses to have fun can hijack the fun for everyone else. But the more that choose to have fun, the greater the fun. Why is that? Well, because fun is not a zero-sum game, but just the opposite. Because the fun of one, because fun is one for all and all for one. Last week I shared that when my children were two, five, seven, and eight, our basement was the kingdom of fun. We'd play ball, didn't keep score, had no rules, but one. You had to pass the ball because that's what makes it fun. Sometimes my two-year-old Coleman would come down the stairs He'd see the fun, knew that he wanted the fun and didn't understand the fun. He didn't understand the fun. So when we passed the ball, he'd run with the ball, hold the ball, then hide in the corner with the ball where he could, what? Imprison the fun in his own unrighteousness. And then I would issue my judgment. Coleman, pass the ball. It'll be fun, it'll be fun. How could I get Coleman to pass the ball? If I were to promise a reward and threaten a punishment, what would I say? If you pass the ball now, I'll let you hold it forever, alone in the basement. Or if you don't pass the ball now, I'll take it and give it back to you so I can take it again and give it back to you again and take it again forever and ever and ever. We'll be passing the ball, that's your punishment by appealing to his current desires with rewards and punishments, I teach him to lust for hell alone in the basement and hate the fun that he longed for in the beginning but did not understand, which is passing the ball. And if he did pass the ball in that state in fear of punishment and longing for some other reward, it wouldn't be fun, right? It wouldn't be play. It would be work. It wouldn't be a blessing. What would it be? The curse. For Coleman, I wanted enough fun that he would surrender his judgment to my judgment just long enough to experience our joy, compound joy, a higher consciousness, the fun that is playing the game. I wanted him to lose his psyche and find it playing the game. And he did. Faith happens when the children watch the father pass the ball, even at great expense to himself. Pass the ball, why? For the joy that is set before him. And you see, that is exactly what's happening in that picture, isn't it? 
God himself has made himself the ball and is passing himself to us. Even though we take his goodness like robbers, his life like thieves, and his love like adulterers, whoremongers, and, and rapists, even though we take him to ourselves, he is giving himself and has always been giving himself to us, his love. Love is a noun, and it's also a verb, right? So that means it's being and doing. The ball... Ball is, is a noun, but it's no fun unless it also becomes a verb, unless you pass it to your neighbor, unless you play ball. In self-giving, if anywhere, we touch a rhythm not only of all creation, but of all being, writes C.S. Lewis. For the eternal word also gives himself in sacrifice, and that not only on Calvary, for when he was crucified, he did that in the wild weather of his outlying provinces, that's here, which he had done at home in glory and gladness, that's heaven. From before the foundation of the world, he surrenders begotten deity back to begetting deity in obedience, and as the Son glorifies the Father, so also the Father glorifies the Son. From the highest to the lowest, self exists to be abdicated, and by that abdication become the more truly self, to be thereupon yet the more abdicated and so forever. This is not a heavenly law, like writes C.S. Lewis, this is not a heavenly law which we can escape by remaining earthly, nor an earthly law which we can escape by being saved. What is outside the system of self-giving is not earth, nor nature, nor ordinary life, but simply and solely hell. The golden apple of selfhood thrown among the false gods became an apple of discord because they scrambled for it. They did not know the first rule of the holy game, which is that every player must by all means touch the ball and then immediately pass it on. To be found with it in your hands is a fault. To cling to it, death. But when it flies to and fro among the players, too swift for I to follow, and the great master himself leads the revelry, giving himself eternally to his creatures in the generation and back to himself in the sacrifice of the word, then indeed the eternal dance, quote, makes heaven drowsy with harmony. All pains and pleasures we have known on earth are early initiations in the movements of that dance. But the dance itself is strictly incomparable with the sufferings of this present time, this present age. As we draw nearer to its uncreated rhythm, pain and pleasure sink almost out of sight. There is joy in the dance. But it does not exist for the sake of joy. It does not even exist for the sake of good or of love. It is love himself and good himself and life himself, I would add, and therefore happy. <laughs> That's fun. The judgment of God is fun. Jesus was so much fun, it got him crucified. He partied with tax collectors and sinners, and the religious folks did not like it. He said he came and he spoke that his joy might be in us. That, uh, that sounds fun. The judgment of God is fun, which should raise an obvious question. Why do Christians seem to have so little fun. Why does Peter Hyatt seem to have so little fun? And why, oh why, did Coleman Hyatt quit football? I think there's one answer, and for now we can call it religion. Verse 16, on that day when according to my good news, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. Next verse, but if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law, what's a Jew? Genesis 12, for no apparent reason, God spoke to a man named Abram somewhere in Iraq saying this, I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse and in you all the families, all the nations, all the peoples of the earth shall be blessed. You know, Abraham fathered Isaac, which means laughter. 
That sounds fun. Abraham fathered Isaac, Isaac fathered Jacob, and each, each uh, of them contained the blessing in the form, sorry, this is the Bible, but uh, in the form of a promised seed, a, a sperma in their loins. Jacob became Israel and fathered 12 sons and became the 12 tribes. Each was commanded to love the Lord God with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength and love their neighbor as their self. That's Old Testament stuff, in case you didn't know. All were blessed to be a blessing to all the nations of the world. God would command them to battle various nations at times, and yet they had still been promised as a blessing to all the nations for all of time. Blessed to be a blessing, but they competed for the blessing, battled each other for the blessing, and did not bless the nations. They held the ball. Judah was the last tribe standing. And in Judah was the promised blessing, the promised seed, the king of the Judeans, the king of the Jews. He was born to a virgin, placed in a manger, and then nailed to a tree in a garden because he seemed bound and determined to bless Greeks and Romans and Canaanites and even party with tax collectors, traitors, and, and sinners, hookers, prostitutes, whores. The Jews were trying to hold the ball, and the ball was bound and determined to give himself away. They were faithless, but God remained faithful. Romans 2.16, if you call yourself a Jew, it appears that Paul called himself a Jew even though he was of the tribe of Benjamin. By the time of Jesus, any semi-faithful Israelite would, would call themselves a, a, a Jew, and as we'll soon find out, Paul will call you a Jew as well. The Jews were Paul's family. The synagogue was his church. It means the gathering, the assembly. A, a Christian was actually a derogatory name given to the followers of Jesus by those that did not follow Jesus. You see, Paul didn't see himself as starting a new religion. Judaism was his religion. And he would consider it to be your religion too. You know, you're wed to the king of the Jews. <laughs> you're grafted into his family tree. You can't get more Jewish than that. So when we read the word Jew, we should also hear another word. And that word is Christian. And when we read law, we should also hear another word, religion. Paul has just made it clear that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil somehow grows in the garden sanctuary of every human heart. A law is what? It's knowledge of good and evil. It's a description of the good. It's the morphe or the form of the good. It's customs, practices, values, rules, regulations with which we judge ourselves. <laughs> and our neighbors, and our God. Law is a description of passing the ball. Love is passing the ball. Life is everyone that happens to be passing the ball. Your life is literally a communion of trillions of individual cells all passing the ball. The life is in the ball. And your life is to be part of a greater life, the life. But you must pass the ball in order to experience the life and join the fun. The law is any description of love and life. But the law is not love. And not life. Verse 17, but if you call yourself a Jew, if you call yourself a Christian and rely on the law, rely on your religion, and boast in God, who is love, right? Boast in love, and you know his will and approve what is excellent because you are instructed from your religion. And if you are sure that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of children, you need to call yourself a teacher of children, you have to judge other people to be children, right? And yourself to be not a child. To call yourself an instructor of the foolish, you have to judge others to be fools. <laughs> Jesus said something about that. And yourself to be wise. To call yourself a light to the blind, you'd have to judge others to be blind and yourself to be the light. 
If you, you're sure, you're, if you are sure that you yourself, you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are, that are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of children, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, isn't Jesus the embodiment of knowledge and truth? Embodiment. So is he a dead body or a living body? Maybe that depends on how you take him in the sanctuary garden of your own heart. Whether you take him as a possession or you receive him as a gift. Whether you hold the ball or you surrender to the ball game. You then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? You then who teach others to pass the ball, do you pass the ball? You who coach football, do you even enjoy football? Do you pass the ball just for the love of the game? Or is it for some other reason? You who preach love, do you use love to preach or just love love? And so you preach. You then who teach others, do you not teach yourself, asked Paul. While you preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? No, it's easy to say, well, no, of course I don't rob temples. Until you sit at the base of this tree and learn that his body is the temple and all those people are his body. And so every time you are loved and refuse to love, you take life from his temple. You take the ball and imprison his life within yourself. It's easy to say, well, no, uh, I've, I've been good. I don't commit adultery until you take a good look at this tree and learn that it's your naked husband that hangs on the tree. And every time you turn to another helper, you commit adultery against him. Bride of, bride of Christ, you were made for communion with him. It's easy to say, of course I don't steal until you get a good look at the tree in the middle of the garden. It turns out that every time you boast, you steal glory from your creator. You are not your own creator and you don't create the good or the life. You can only receive the life as a gift and then like Pass it around. You who boast in the law, you who boast in your religion, dishonor God by breaking the law. For as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. The name of Christ is blasphemed among the nations because of Christians. <laughs> it's like Gandhi said to the evangelist E. Stanley Jones. He said, I love your Christ. It's just that so many of you Christians are not like Christ. The name of Christ is blasphemed among the nations and it's blasphemed in our own nation because of Christians. We lost the culture war. <laughs> you know why? Because we fought it in the first place. Or at least we fought it with the wrong weapons. We fought it with worldly weapons. We have fought by actually seizing power, attempting to claim our rights through legislation. That's the law. All the while claiming to follow a king who surrendered all power, forfeited all rights, and gave his life for his enemies. That's love. So we talk about grace, and yet we are like profoundly ungraceful. We're like stone temples that enslave the spirit deep within. We're like clay vessels that imprison the truth in our unrighteousness. We're like old wineskins that desperately need to burst and bleed new wine. We're like foreskins that inhibit communion. Yep, I said foreskins. It's so cool. I didn't write the Bible, and that's what the Bible says. Religious people are like foreskins that numb the world to the joy of communion with God. 
Next verse, 25. For circumcision indeed is of value if you obey the law. But if you break the law, your circumcision, your religion becomes acrobusia. Literally, foreskin. This is all rather astonishing. <laughs> but hopefully you remember that the very first religious act that God asked Abraham to do, you know, after making Abraham watch him cut the covenant, 400 years before God gives the law in the form of the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai, the very first religious thing that God asked Abraham to do, when Abraham was 99 years old, God said to Abraham, you and all the males in your household will be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins. It's the sign of the covenant. And if Abraham didn't say it, you know he thought it. Uh, couldn't we just wear t-shirts. Maybe we could start a 501c3 nonprofit organization, you know. Oh, maybe we could come up with a vision plan, five-year vision plan, a 10-year vision plan, and, a, and a, uh, some kind of belief statement, and, and we'd have make some rules and regulations that everybody would kind of agree to together if they wanted to join the institution, but but, but cut the skin off the tip of my penis? Why? 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 Well, it must certainly have something to do with the fact that humans were created to produce fruit. That is, more humans. Through intimate communion in the sacrament of the covenant of marriage, just as believers are created to bear the fruit of the Spirit through intimate communion in the sacrament of the covenant of grace, and if things are working optimally, this is rather fun. Why are you doing that? It's fun. I'm trying to avoid all double entendres here. But that's a picture of something utterly profound. It's a picture of passing the ball. We call it making love. Although more truly, it's love making us. That's where you came from, children. <laughs> Three weeks ago, we pointed out that Jesus was single. And yet he came to be married to each of us and all of us. With bread and wine, he proposed a marriage covenant. On the tree in the garden, according to Paul, he was circumcised. He then delivered up his spirit that it might descend into each one of us. He passed the ball, the promised blessing. The prophets tell us that circumcision really isn't about penises. Sorry, I just have to say the word. We're so, it's so weird how uptight we are in our culture, even though we're totally profligate. But the prophets tell us that circumcision really isn't about penises. It's about the thing to which the penis is attached. <laughs> a man's heart. The foreskin is a picture of the leathery skin that grows around a human heart as men and women seek to hide themselves from the love of God. And you see, this is all so truly astonishing on so many levels, but one of which, it, it means that obedience is really not something we can do. So much as something that happens when we are undone, circumcised. Faith is not an addition that we make. It's more like a subtraction that God makes allowing our hearts to commune with his. For circumcision is indeed of value, verse 25, if you obey the law. But if you break the law, your circumcision, your religion becomes foreskin. So if foreskin, now check this out. This is what Jews called Gentiles in that day. And I'm, I doubt it was politically correct, but they called them foreskins. If foreskin keeps the precepts of the law, will not his foreskin be regarded as circumcision? Then he who is physically a foreskin, but keeps the law, will condemn you who have the written code um, and circumcision, but break the law. 
For no one is a Jew, no one is a Christian who is merely one outwardly. Let me say that again. No one is a Jew who is merely one out. No one's a Christian who is merely one outwardly. Nor is circumcision outward and physical, but a Jew, a Christian, is one inwardly. And circumcision, baptism, communion is a matter of the heart, but the spi- by the Spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. You see, only God knows if you are playing ball with him in the sanctuary of your own soul. But the world will begin to figure it out by whether or not you're having any fun, by whether or not they see the fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faith, and self-control. Paul is, is pointing out, he's also pointing out that this fruit grows on Gentiles as well as Jews, on non-Christians as well as Christians, whatever you mean by that. And, and so he anticipates the following response, chapter 3, verse 1, which I have heard a million times, then what advantage has the Jew? Can I rephrase that for you? Why be a Jew if God also loves Gentiles? Why obey the law if one day everyone will obey the law? Why would I be a Christian if everyone gets saved in the end? Why forgive my enemies now if I don't get to despise them later? Why worship a savior that saves everyone? Why love if there's no reward for loving? Why pass the ball now if I don't get to hold it forever all alone in the corner of the basement? Why play if I don't win? I remember looking at two-year-old Coleman holding the ball in the corner of the basement while we all waited for him to lose the ball and join the fun. I remember thinking, perhaps not in these words, but I do remember thinking this. <laughs> this is so weird. I mean, the angels must look at us and think this. This is so weird. Coleman, can't you see that you've already won? I have already made up my mind about you, Coleman. I have already judged you. You've won. <laughs> Coleman, I am yours, and you are mine. Coleman, all things are yours. The house is yours. All these toys are yours. The basement is yours. Your brother and your sisters are all yours. Mom is yours. I am yours. And the ball is yours. I bought the ball for you. But you won't have any fun until you've learned to give it away. Passing the ball is not payment for some reward, Coleman. Passing the ball is the reward. Why, it's your first step into a world of fun. Well, as I told you last time, I kept passing the ball to Coleman, and one day he surrendered his judgment to my judgment. He he revealed just like a mustard seed of faith buried deep in his soul, and so he passed the ball to someone else. And before he knew it, he had lost himself and found himself in a world of fun. Actually, a communion of fun, one for all and all for one. As I said last time, Coleman and I would just stand out in the street for hours throwing the ball back and forth, back and forth, passing the ball. Not holding the ball, passing the ball. In elementary school, Coleman joined a peewee football team. He worked like crazy. And yet to him, it wasn't work, it was, it was play. They won some, they lost some, but either way, Coleman had fun just because he loved playing the game. I remember one day I said to him, buddy, doesn't it bother you when the coach yells at you? And he looked at me with this confused look, and he said, well, Dad, isn't that what the coach is supposed to do? As a kid, I was so insecure about me, I couldn't lose myself in the game, and so I rarely enjoyed the game, and I wasn't very good at the game. But Coleman got good at the game. He made varsity at Bear Creek High School his sophomore year, and Bear Creek was good. And yet at the end of his junior year, I remember he came to me and said, Dad, I don't want to play football anymore. I said, why? Remember he said, Dad, it's it's just not even fun. My coach is like all about winning games. And so no one plays the game just for the love of the game. 
Dad, I miss playing football with my friends. That's what made it fun. Coleman didn't say this, but he could have said this. Dad, I don't think my coach is circumcised. I mean, he does not love playing the game. He only loves winning the game, so we try to win games and we've lost all the fun. If you play to win, you've already lost because you're not playing. This is what I mean. If you follow Jesus in order to beat your neighbor and win a game, you're not following Jesus. You're crucifying Jesus and you're losing the war. You're seeking to win your life and so you've already lost it. You're seeking to be first when Jesus rejoiced at being last. You're seeking to exalt yourself, and Jesus implores you, humble yourself. The false gods of this world all seek to hold the ball and so, not, and so cannot comprehend the game. The evil one cannot comprehend love. The false gods of this world all seek to hold the ball and so cannot comprehend the game. In fact, they're terrified of the game. The true God, the persons of the Godhead, the three for one and one for three, they constantly humble themselves and exalt the other. God is fun. He's fun. And so the Jews went to the Gentiles and asked them to crucify Jesus. You see, it's religion that crucifies the king of fun. It's just how that escapes us over and over and again is shocking. But it's, it's religion that crucifies the king of fun, and yet then and there is precisely when and where the king of fun wins the war. It's on the tree that he lifts his head, surrenders his spirit, passes the ball, wins the war, and makes all things new. He is the judgment of God. He is the door to the new creation, the, the age to come. It's great to play games in order to learn to pass the ball. And so one team might try to beat another team to win a game, but that game is a game. It must never be the war. We are engaged in a war. But not against people or a team of people. We battle the void. We battle the void with the presence of God. We battle non-being with being. We battle desecration with creation. We battle division with communion. We battle evil by passing the ball. We, we battle death with love, and when everyone loves, all is life, and everyone that's anyone wins the war. Actually, Jesus has already won the war. And the day you believe it is the day you'll begin to have fun playing his game. Which is really a dance. The dance that never ends because it is the end eternal life. He is the judgment of God. He is the commandment of God. He is life eternal. Romans 3.1. Then what advantage has the Jew? See how insane that question is? What advantage has the Christian? Or what is the value of circumcision or baptism or communion? Paul said, well, well, much in every way. To begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the sayings of God. What if some were unfaithful? Does their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? Just because you don't pass the ball and so don't win a game, would you suppose that God loses the war? God has already won the war so that you might enjoy playing the game. What if some were unfaithful? Does their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? Now this is how my Greek teacher told me literally this should be translated. Does their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? Hell no! Let God be true, though every man is a liar, writes Paul. So Jews are judged by the same judgment as Gentiles for the judgment of God is fun. 
One for all and all for one. Why don't Christians have more fun? Religion. Why doesn't Peter Hyatt have more fun? I can't describe this in detail, and you don't need to believe that it really happened, although it did. Late one night with Susan and praying for a friend struggling with memories of abuse, the evil one manifested in our friend. At one point, he grabbed my hand, put something in my hand, and wrapped my fingers around it tightly as if wrapping them around a ball, and then he tried to hold them there. I blew on his hand. The breath burned like fire, and he let go, and then he left my friend. When it was all over, my friend said to me, I need to tell you, I was aware enough to know that something was putting something in your hand, Peter. It wants you to hang on and never let go. I don't know what it is, but you need to let it go. And almost immediately, I think I knew what it was. It was you. And this church. And a reformation that I so desperately want to see happen. It was the good. You see, Satan can only tempt us with the good. We were made for the good. He can only tempt us with the good. And he tempts me with the good by making me believe that, that I have to win the war to save the good. And so what do I do? I make rules for myself and judge myself and condemn myself. And then I beg him to let me stop playing the game because I'm not having any fun. Jesus wants me, Peter Hyatt, to trust that he's won the war so I can have fun playing the game. There's only one rule, and that's pass the ball. Because you want to pass the ball. Preach, because you want to preach. Love, this is for you. Love because you love love. That's called faith. And it manifests as fun. If you're not having fun, ask the Lord, am I holding the ball? And if you are, which I'm sure you are, don't just make a bunch of rules about passing the ball and so judge yourself for not passing the ball and then create a bunch of laws so you can pass the ball better and so win the game. That's religion. And it's the death of fun. I said, confess, Dad, I'm not passing the ball. And then watch once again as he passes the ball to you. Sweetheart, this is, this is my body given to you. This is the covenant in my blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, drink of it, all of you. Then pass the ball. Amen. And so to you, Dad, we pass the ball. We worship you. And it really is all kind of funny because, God, I think we live our whole lives so desperately afraid of losing the ball or passing the ball. But one day, Lord, this old body of mine, this flesh will, will die. I'll breathe my last. And I'm sure it'll scare the poop out of me. And then you'll pass the ball back to me and start laughing. <laughs> so God, I pray that you would help us to believe the gospel so we could be free right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Sometimes people say, Peter, what difference does it make? I mean, this church sacrificed a lot. You sacrificed a lot to preach this message. What difference does it make? And I, have, I just get an aneurysm almost. And this is the way to describe it. Can you imagine what difference it would have made 
If I had left the basement for a moment or two, someone came in and talked to my children and said, hey guys, your dad seems like a good guy, but you need to know this. If you win this game, he will reward you with blessings just unbelievable. Isn't that great? And if you lose, he will torture you forever and ever and ever, and you will never join the game. If my kids believe that just a little bit, do you think that would affect the way they played the game? Oh, they might work really, really hard at playing the game, but they wouldn't trust me. They wouldn't love me, and it would be absolutely no fun. I think for the last 1,500 years or so, the church has largely not been playing the game. So may you believe the gospel, pass the ball, and have fun. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'd like uh, prayer, members of the prayer team, Ted's down front here, and we invite you to come forward and pray with them. Mm -hmm.